I want to take you to a journey to the borderland between music on the one side and mathematics on the other side to show you some of the magic that lies in between these two topics. I'm a mathematician and for me mathematics is the science of patterns and structures and Patterns and structures are all around us in art, in nature and in music. And whenever we hear patterns or see patterns and start to resonate with them, we ultimately also resonate with mathematics. A while ago, me and a couple of friends and colleagues decided that we want to design a hands-on exhibition on mass and music. And for that hands-on exhibition, we were looking for topics that are at the same time tangible and playful and deep enough that we could present them to audiences of all various kinds, to children of all ages, four to 99, uh, but also to experts in either of the fields. So experts in music, experts in mathematics, and worst of all, experts in both of those fields. And we found many very, very interesting effects. And one of the most exciting and almost mysterious objects uh, in that endeavor we found was what you see here. So what you see here is at the same time an artistic mandala. It is a map of all musical pentatonic scales and it is a musical instrument with which you can make music. And the idea of my presentation today is to show you the various aspects that lie behind this particular pattern. Two topics that we have to talk about in that context are symmetry and evenness, and both play a really important role in art, in music, in science, in mathematics. Let us start with symmetry. The famous Nobel laureate Richard Feynman once coined symmetry in the following way. An object is symmetric if you can do something to it, such that after you've done that, it looks exactly the same as before. This is ingenious. So this is a concept that combines form and action in the most general way and you discover it over and over in the world. So in nature, take a snowflake, rotate it by 60 degrees and it looks exactly as before. Uh, in art, take a wallpaper pattern from the Alhambra, shift it by a certain amount and it looks exactly as before. In music, take a simple melody, repeat it one octave higher and it sounds essentially the same as before, just a little higher. And in its purest form, obviously, in mathematics. Take, for instance, regular n-gons, rotate each of them by a certain amount, and it looks exactly as before. I want to teach you a simple trick how to turn the symmetries of n-gons into a nice rhythmical pattern. And for this, we do the following. We overlay, for instance, a triangle and a square. And uh, then we have a rotating hand. And every time this hand meets a peak of the triangle, so one of the vertices or of the square, you hit one or the other drum. And this is what you get sounds like this here. So I slow it down a little bit. Uh, so you see one drum is playing the square and the other drum is playing the triangle and uh, well in that slow speed you won't recognize the rhythm but as soon as you speed up uh, you get a nice rhythmical pattern. You can do the same thing also with five gone and three gone and uh, even you can take one of those uh, n gons to be an extremely simple n gon just take the two gone which is a line segment. Now I want to teach you how to learn this specific rhythm here. And for that, we do the following. And I promise you that this is really also a good meditation exercise and even a good counting exercise for your kids. So take your two numbers, the two and the three, and their least common multiple, which is six. 
Now take the six numbers zero to five. So you have to start with zero and write them in a circle like here. And if you look at this here, you see all multiples of two. So the two, the four, and remember zero is a multiple of every number. They form a triangle while the multiples of three form your two gun, your line segment here. And now you have to do a little counting exercise to make a rhythm out of that. And this goes as follows. So uh, first you have to learn regular counting like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Next, you emphasize the multiples of 2. This sounds like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Next, you learn how to clap that, say, with your hand on your chest. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Now comes the complicated part. Now, while clapping here, you emphasize the multiples of 3. This takes a little practice, like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And now you clap that as well, like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And if you got to that point, you just have to make that without the counting and speeding up, like... Or even faster. Looks pretty impressive in a Tarzan movie. Uh, and promised you can learn that uh, in, say, one hour or two hours and even together with your kids. So this was symmetry in rhythm. How about symmetry in melody? Take our usual piano keyboard. And if you look at it, you will immediately see that you have symmetry in that keyboard. You have a repeating pattern from here to here to here. You have always the same distribution of white and black keys. So if you shift your piano keyboard by one octave, it looks exactly as before. And this has a correspondence to sound. So this and this and this key are all C's. Let us make a version of the piano keyboard uh, where all C's and all D's are somehow similar. So we name our tones, our keys in the usual way. And you see our piano keyboard goes on uh, quite a while. And now we spiral the piano keyboard uh, together and we spiral that long until all the C's point into the same direction. So we have to rotate quite a while, but eventually we'll come to that point where all C's point in one direction, all D's point in the next direction, and so on. And you see the white points here are the white keys of the piano keyboard, and the black points are the black keys on the piano keyboard. And so this is a kind of spiral piano. And you may ask, how does piano piece look like if you play it on that piano? And for that, I want to show you a little demonstration. So in the middle here, you have all these points. They are the spiral of tones. And we take a classical piece, say the flight of a bumblebee by Rimsky Korsakov and watch how this looks like on this special piano. So whenever a note is hit, the corresponding point lights up.
You may have wondered what these bars were that were lighting up. Whenever a certain note is emphasized a lot by the musical piece, then this bar lights up. The amazing thing is that different musical pieces really look different in that framework. So let's compare uh, the Bumblebee with Debussy and his Arabesque number one. You may have observed that in the Debussy tune, very often five bars lit up. And the reason for that is that pentatonics, music made out of five different notes, is a major composing principle in Debussy's work. And this brings me to the next topic, evenness. For me, evenness is a way to arrange objects without too much clustering. So take again 12 points on a circle and say you want to distribute five black points on this circle of 12 white points. So this here would be a pretty uneven way of distributing these points, while this here would be a very even way to distribute them. So uh, you see your black points are scattered in a way that are optimally far apart. And it turns out that this position of points here really corresponds to the distribution of black keys on a piano keyboard. And the black keys on a piano keyboard form a pentatonic scale. And a pentatonic scale really sounds nice. Actually, there are different ways of uh, making an even distribution of these five points, like this one or this one. And you actually can arrange these different ways in a nice way on a circle. So let me give a color to that special sound of this particular type of scale. And if you now take all 12 possibilities, you can arrange them nicely in a circle such that any two that are close to each other just differ by one half tone. There are other scales that are less evenly distributed. Let's listen to them. So for instance, I could move the black points a little bit closer together. Do you hear the difference? This sounds a little bit more tense. I can move them even closer together. So now we have a gap of three here and it sounds still more tense. And we can include these scales also in our pictures. So these are the scales that are a little bit less even and these are those scales that even have this gap of three and they form a nice structure. And uh, if you now start to decorate that, you get our pentatonic mandala map. And actually, this really is a mandala. It has a rotational symmetry. So if you rotate it by 60 degrees, it completely agrees with itself like the snowflake. And now you can use that uh, as a musical instrument and walk along the edges in that structure to make small and musically meaningful uh, modulations.
So at the very end, let me go one step further. Let's take this pattern here and let's take our flight of the bumblebee and turn Rimsky Korsakov into an impressionistic piece by instead of playing the original notes, playing notes that are close by and taken from a selected scale here. And while we go through the flight of the bumblebee, make a walk in our structure here. This sounds like that. I hope you agree, there is quite a lot of magic between math and music. Thanks for your attention.